and I have, I'm very happy to introduce two very special guests today. Dr. Cornell West is a prominent and provocative democratic intellectual. He is a professor of philosophy and Christian practice at Union Theological Seminary and Professor Emeritus at Princeton University. He also taught at Yale, Harvard, and at the University of Paris. He graduated magna cum laude from Harvard and obtained his MA and PhD in philosophy at Princeton. He has written more than 20 books and has edited 13. He is best known for his classics, Race Matters and Democracy Matters, and his memoir, Brother West, Living and Loving Out Loud. He appears frequently on the Colbert Report, CNN, and C-SPAN. And he also made his film debut in The Matrix. And he was also a commentator with Kevin Wilbur on the official trilogy released in 2004. Black Prophetic Fire, Dr. West's later, latest book with distinguished scholar Krista, you have to help me with this name, Bushendorf, provides a fresh perspective on six revolutionary African-American leaders, including Frederick Douglass, W.E.B. Du Bois, Martin Luther King Jr., Ella, ba Ella Baker, Malcolm X, and Ida Wells Barnett. West examines the impact of these men and women on their eras and across the decades. He not only rediscovers the integrity and commitment within these passionate advocates, but also their fault lines. By providing new insights that humanize all of these well-known figures, West takes, an, West takes an important step in rekindling the black prophetic fire so essential in the age of Obama. Helen Atwan. Helen has been director of the Beacon Press since, since October 1995. She holds a master's degree in English literature from the University of Virginia. She began her career in publishing at Random House in 1976. Her acquisitions at Beacon include Gail Jones' The Healing, a national book finalist, Rashid Khalid's The Iron Cage, Richard Blanco's For All of Us, One Today, Cornell West's Black Prophetic Fire, and Anita Hill's Reimagining Equality. She served for eight years on the board of Penn New England and is the administrator of the Hemingway Foundation Penn Award. Thank you both for being here today. Thank you. Thank you for that very warm Miami welcome. It's a great pleasure to be here today with all of you, and I have the greater honor of being in dialogue with Professor West. So in addition to the introduction you just heard, I want to say that um, Cornell West is working on two other books with us, and one coming up soon is his edition of the writings of Martin Luther King Jr which will be called appropriately The Radical King. That will be published on Dr. King's birthday and I think you should all look out for that. And then his next book after that will be a very important one, Justice Matters. So we're very much looking forward to that as well. So I'm gonna ask Cornell to talk briefly about each of the six figures that he discusses in the new book and then to reflect on how their legacy impacts us today and then I'm gonna turn the floor over for the questions. So, Michelle Alexander said of Black Prophetic Fire that this was a fascinating exploration of the black prophetic genius and fire. I'd like to start by asking you how you define black prophetic fire and then we can talk about each of the figures. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you for that question. I'd like to just begin briefly by saluting first Helen, who's my publisher, who I'm very blessed to work with. She worked with James Baldwin, or the same press. She's not old enough to work with Baldwin. <laughs> but uh, the same press worked with James Baldwin, Mary Wright Edelman, Sonia Sanchez, so many other towering figures. And I'd like to salute President Jorge Pedron and Brother Mitchell Kaplan. Let's give them a hand. Those are the two leaders. 31 years. 31 years, that's a beautiful thing. And that kind of alliance too, you know, a Latino brother and a Jewish brother, I like to see that kind of uh, collaboration and coagulation. <laughs> but black prophetic fire. 
Well, I just want to begin by saying, you see, I am who I am because somebody loved me and somebody cared for me and somebody attended to me. So, so I'm trying to keep track of my own fire that I got from Irene and Clifton and my brother Clifton and sister Cynthia and Cheryl. The fire I got from Shiloh Baptist Church, Reverend Willie P. Cook and Deacon Hinton and Sarah Ray, my vacation Bible school teacher. These were people who provided in lived experience an answer to Du Bois's four questions. How does integrity face oppression? How does honesty face deception? How does decency face insult? And how does virtue meet brute force? Integrity, honesty, decency, and a sense of virtue in the face of what? Tear, trauma, stigma. I come from a people who've been terrorized for 400 years traumatized for 400 years in the United States. And so when we talk about Frederick Douglass, we talk about W.B. Du Bois, we talk about Ella Baker and Ida B. Wells, Barnett or Malcolm or Martin, you're talking about folk holding on to integrity, honesty, decency, a sense of virtue, being willing to tell the truth, expose lies, but still do it with love in their heart. Compassion in the face of catastrophe. We are blues people. We wrestling with the catastrophic, not just problems. No such thing as a Negro problem. It's catastrophe visited on black people. And the question is that prophetic fire responds to that catastrophe. We have a deep sense of trying to tell the truth and most importantly, a willingness to pay the cost. A willingness to sacrifice your popularity for integrity. Sacrifice fitting in for bearing witness, and I'm very proud to be a small part of that great tradition of a great people. And in this Ferguson moment, we need it more than ever, more than ever. You begin the book with Frederick Douglass. Um, a really interesting choice because he was a very complicated guy, wasn't he? And tell us about his bearing witness and the point at which maybe he lost sight of that. Yeah, well, of course, the book is dedicated to David Walker and Harriet Tubman, two towering folks always already on fire. Harriet Tubman, 19 times, he goes back into the belly of the beast. And David Walker appealed to colored citizens of the world. He's a dead man nine years later in a hotel in Boston. But oh, he told the truth with a bounty on his head. That's my kind of brother. <laughs> Willing to tell that kind of truth, the vicious forms of evil in this society, not just white supremacy, but of course it spills over. Treatment of our indigenous peoples, subordination of women, subordination of working people, anti-Jewish, anti-Arab, anti-Muslim, anti-Catholic, all of those part of our history, but white supremacy sitting at the center. And so Frederick Douglass, of course, is who, what? He is the most eloquent ex-slave in the history of the modern world. And by eloquence, I mean what Cicero and Quintilian defined by eloquence, wisdom speaking in the face of catastrophe with a bounty on his head, with a bounty on his head. And there's simply nobody like him. Now, it's true, he does become part of the Republican Party. He does become part of the American imperial machinery vis-a-vis -vis his relation to both Haiti as well as Dominican Republic. And so I've got my critique, because it's hard to be on fire for a long time. You see, after 1867, 65, he had 30 years to live. See, Malcolm's gone at 39, Martin's gone at 39. Ella Baker was on fire her whole life, we'll get to that. Ida B. Wells was on fire her whole life. It's hard to be on fire your whole life. <laughs> and we know that, because we live in the age of the sellout, don't we? Oh my God, we had folk who were on fire in, their tw in 20 and 30, and now you look at them, they so well adjusted in justice, they hardly even discern what's going on with the fire in Ferguson. Hardly discern what's going on when they look at freedom fighters like Ashley Yates and Tef Poe and Alexis Templeton and Tory Russell and Brother Wiley and Sister Joe Netta, them right now in the belly of the beast in, I was gonna say Mississippi, Ferguson. Let's jump to Ida B. Wells, in fact, yeah, um, yeah. because she was an extraordinary woman, yeah. and I, 
I discovered so much about her. I don't think a lot of people know very much about her. Just, uh, you know, tell me your, your story of Ida B. Wells. Yeah, I wish Ida B. Wells' name was as well known as Martin Luther King Jr. Malcolm X. In many ways, she's probably the most courageous person in this text to the degree to which she was willing to write a classic in 1892, A Southern Whore, another classic in 1895, A Red Tear, doing what? Telling the truth about American terrorism. Now, we would a lot of talk about terrorism in the world, especially since 9-11. Well, all Americans feel unsafe, unprotected, subject to random violence, but hated for who they are. Well, to be black in America for 400 years is to be unsafe, unprotected, subject to random violence, and hated for who you are. But we kind of, kind of, we got a 9 11 fied condition. It happens every week, it happens every month, it happens every year. It's not something that happens one time and everybody gets all afraid. No, but what did Ida B. Wells do? While Booker T. Washington and Du Bois were arguing about education and civil rights, she was confronting American terrorism, lynching, it, the raw face of the American nation state with courage, and they ran her out of Tennessee, put a bounty on her head. If it were not for T. Thomas Fortune in New York age that received her in New York, and they still hunted her down in New York, and she had to leave the country and go to Britain. And she came back with her classics. I got something to say about the underside, the night side of America. You got terrorism at your center called Jim Crow and Jane Crow. Now, of course, in our textbooks, they call it segregation. No, that's a deodorized term. We're talking about American terrorism. Where every two and a half days, there was some precious black man, a black woman, a black child hanging from some tree, that strange fruit, the southern trees bear that the great Billy Holiday sing about with such power, and the Jewish brother Maripo writing the lyrics. It was Ida B. Wells that led that serious struggle. Then she organized black women in the Black Women's Club. And so we need to know much more about Ida B. Wells, her classic pursuit of the crusader for justice. We need to know more about how she was able to sustain her fight. And of course, she's a Sunday school teacher in Chicago. She still led the club movement from Chicago, but was also mistreated, as was the case for every individual in this text, for many black people themselves. Why? Because when you're on fire in that way, but when you've been niggerized in America, taught to hate yourself, believe you have the wrong hips and lips and noses and hair texture, believe you're less beautiful, less intelligent, and less moral. And black folk have been niggerized in America for 400 years. And she, like the others in this book, have de-niggerized themselves. And they try to de-niggerize black people and say, don't be afraid, don't be intimidated, don't be scared. Straighten your back up, lift your voice, have a sense of dignity, organize and mobilize with others who are willing to straighten their backs up. So there's deep reflection in the text about how she was oftentimes misunderstood and misconstrued by black folk, including the great Du Bois himself. And we love Du Bois, but all human beings are cracked vessels. We're trying to humanize across the board. But I had to be Wells, my God, I wish she was our household. Her name was a household word, very much so. Maybe it will be soon. Well, we've got, we've got so many other voices, especially black women voices and brown women voices and others uh, raising their voices. We were just with Sister Daisy Hernandez, her magnificent text, uh, Cup of Water Under, what is it called? Cup of Water Under My Bed. Under My Bed. I thought it was every bed. No, it's her bed, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, indeed. No, but that's it's very important to have these women voices, women of color voice, but also white sisters can get in on it if they're willing to tell the truth and bear witness. And cut against the grain, I cut against the grain. Oh, yes, absolutely. Oh, men too, brothers too. Tell us, in fact, since we're talking about sanitized, um, tell us about MLK and his Santa Clausification. What do you mean by that? Yeah, you know, each time you even just mention Brother Martin's name, that's like talking about John Coltrane, Nina Simone, and Curtis Mayfield. You just got to pause for a moment. How in the face of so much hatred and contempt could he dish out so much love? In the face of so much terror, you, you recall he's in the, the paddy wagon in the 1960s, just him in the dark with a German shepherd coming at him every moment. 
and Andy Young and his father, the only two there to receive him at Reedsville Prison. When he walks out, look like Martin's had a nervous breakdown. And he only has one word to say. He says, this is the price we must pay for the freedom of our people. That's who we're talking about when we're talking about Martin King. And he's not alone. He's a product of a tradition. He comes out of a rich black church tradition. I'm told Brother Moses is here somewhere from Arizona. He understands that. And so what happens to this Martin Luther King Jr., where he gets sanitized and sterilized? <laughs> because that much black love and that much black fire is always a threat to America. America misunderstands black rage as always being connected to revenge. Black rage can be connected to black love. And justice is what love looks like in public, just like tenderness is what love feels like in private. And he was a tender man, too, just like Malcolm. He was a gentle man. He was a sweet man. But he had a deep commitment to justice. When he died, 72% of Americans disapproved of him. 55% of black people disapproved of Martin when he died. Ooh, everybody loves him now that the worms got him. Mm -hmm. The FBI said he's the most dangerous man in America. How come? So much love. So much fire. Why was it that he was unpopular at the end? The critique of empire, America, my own government is the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. He's telling the truth and vis a vis Vietnam, trying to organize all poor people, going beyond civil rights, talking about rights for black people, he's talking about human rights. That he and Malcolm X had already talked about in 64, going to the United Nations, bringing America to trial for the violation of human rights of black people. That's the Martin that scared folk. And understandably so, because when you're working at that level of love and fire, it can be very, very difficult to embrace. Because you, again, you have to embrace at a cost, you see. And so, of course, the text Radical King is going to lay this. Right. Because we've turned, him, we've turned him into Santa Claus. We've Santa Claus, yeah, exactly. Turn him into an old man with a smile with toys in his bag, and everybody can't wait to see him. <laughs> we did the same thing to Nelson Mandela, but that's another text. For another time, you see. Brother Martin, or this radical king. But, but keep track of the centrality of the love commitment. Keep track of the centrality of the compassion and the willingness to pay a cost. I mean, and this is part of the challenge of our younger generation. This book, in many ways, is a love letter to the younger generation. Because I'm passing from the scene. You know, I know, I, know I'm, I, don't, I don't need to be center stage. I'm trying to tell that to Brother Al Sharpton, you know? <laughs> <laughs> You don't need to be center stage, brother. There's something called grassroots leadership, indigenous leadership in these different contexts. Get out of the way of the camera. Let the young folks speak. Get out of the way of the camera. Let, let them tell their truths. You stand alongside them. That's what we did when we went to Ferguson. We said, no, we go into jail when we go to Ferguson. Why? We want the young folk to know some of us old school folk love them and love them deeply. We might not fully understand everything, but we are in solidarity with them, even as we want to respect, protect, but also correct them, we, long, we stand alongside them. It's like Coltrane allowing Eric Dolphy to play, allowing Mike McCoy Tyler, a teenager, to play. Coltrane could have been center stage every performance. He would say what? Let the young voices in. Come on, Farrell Sanders. Come on, Eric. Come on, Archie Shep. You all understand what I'm talking about in terms of what it means to try to tell your truth, but also make room for the young folk coming through because so many of them been unloved and uncared for and unattended to and I've been so loved and cared for and attended to for three lifetimes and that's just the West household. <laughs> we ain't even got the Shiloh Baptist Church yet or Harvard or Yale at Princeton. So it's a matter of keeping what the Isley brothers call the caravan of love going.
speech as an isolated individual rather than part and parcel of the group. That's why Count Basie was always with the group. And it wasn't just the Count Basie band and him projecting himself with some individual all by himself. No, Count understood there's no Count without the group. There's no Duke without Johnny Hedges and the Duke Ellington band. We could go on and on and on. So good to have Mama Cole and uh, Sister Maria here too. It's a blessing. Okay, let's start with the questions. Thank you on that high note. You're welcome. Thanks for being here. And thank you for continuing it's the struggle. My name is Paul Fletcher. You know my dad, Arthur A. Fletcher. And uh, From so, Kansas? Yeah, yes. Yes! So, it, it went to school with my father. I just want to mention that, though. Absolutely. So, I was just uh, skimming through your book, uh, and I noticed uh, one of the subjects that I definitely am concerned with it. I read in the New York Times that it was $60 trillion that the banks used to laundry arms and drug money from the cartel and selling arms to the Iranians. And I was like, and nobody went to jail. Nobody went to jail, and yet we're going to jail for you know, petty drugs. And I'm glad that you mentioned, but when I tell people $60 trillion, they still look at me like I'm talking about something that can't be imagined. And I'm like, yeah, it's hard to believe that when you know, this economy is $4 trillion and we got $60 trillion being stolen and nobody, too big, they said, to go to jail. I would like you to further comment on but that. And you said that's in the book, though, brother? That's, that's, that was in the New York Times. Oh, oh in the Times? Yeah. Oh, I thought that was no. in my book. I no. No, in the well, somebody in snuck something in my text, but all right, I got you, I got you, I understand, no, in, I understand. In the, in the book, you start out, you start out in, yeah. the, in the beginning talking yes. about nobody went to jail for, well, oh, the, for, the, for the catastrophe of 2008. For the bank. Oh, yeah. for all the crimes committed yeah. on Wall Street, inside right. of trade, right. market manipulation, right. fraudulent activity, yeah. absolutely right. Not only that, but Jamie Dimon calls up the White House and makes a deal and had to do with right money, and most of the tax write-off for J.P. Morgan anyway. Whereas let Jamal and Letitia let Juanita and Juan get caught with a crack bag straight to jail. That's a criminal justice system that is in some ways criminal. Right. That is in some ways criminal. It's true. If we're going to have rule of law, you talk about rule of law for poor people, let's have rule of law for rich people. Let's have rule of law for Wall Street. If you're going to have it for Main Street, let's be consistent with Jane Austen would have called constancy, ethical constancy. And it needs to be pointed out. The same is true in terms of student loans. I was just at uh, Santa Cruz just, just yesterday with the students sitting in. Why? Increasing tuitions. Interest rates for students, still out of control. What were interest rates for banks for over three and a half years from the Federal Reserve? Almost zero. How come the banks treat it that way and students treat it another way? Which group is more important for the future of the country? The students or the banks? What are we talking about? War priorities. It's not a matter of hating on rich people. Some rich folk can choose to do the right thing. At least it's right in my view, and I'll fight for their right to be wrong. I'm a libertarian about these things. <laughs> but we have to tell the truth in regard to how warped our criminal justice system really is. And you all know Michelle Alexander's great text, The New Jim Crow. Oh, absolutely. Thank you for being here. Um, my question really is not about the case, not about the facts, um, not about a verdict, but it's really, the question is about what do you think Martin Luther King would say about the reaction, the protests in Ferguson? From the young people themselves, my sister? No, what I'm saying is, I guess, if I was to say how I feel, and maybe sure. that helps the question, Sh sure. I feel like Martin Luther King stood for peace and peaceful protest. So I'm wondering, oh, yes. what do you think he would say about what's going on there? Oh, I see what you're saying, my dear. So, no, no, Martin, of course, we can't speak on behalf of Martin, though, but um, just based on his life, his work, his witness, uh, he would certainly call for resistance, but it would be nonviolent resistance. That's the kind of brother he was. Resistance, but nonviolent resistance, which is to say he wouldn't go to Ferguson and say, we got to cool things off. He wouldn't say that. Because he don't, he said, you cool things off, folk end up in a deep freeze. <laughs> no, no, no. The challenge has always been, this is true for black spokespersons from the very beginning. How do you 
channel your rage into love and justice rather than hatred and revenge? That's the question. And that's the question Martin Luther King was wrestling with, and he answered it with nonviolent resistance. So I think, I, I think in fact, you're right. But keep in mind, though, but in calling for peace and calm is not downplaying the violations that have been that have taken place, not just in Ferguson, every 28 days, every 28 hours, a precious young black brother or sister is shot by either police or security guard. So this is the peak of an iceberg. You see. So you can't go in and say, well, we're concerned about the violence of the young folk and not deal with the violence of the system that's coming at them. And Martin Luther King would want to accent that, you see. But Martin was, like myself, he was a Jesus-loving free black man. He put love at the center. And America ought to be grateful. In fact, in some ways, America ought to just see black people and give them a standing ovation. <laughs> oh, yes. How are you going to put up with all this hatred, all this terror, all this contempt, and you're still dishing out to Stevie Wonders about love and Martin King's and John Coltrane's Love Supremes. What is it about these people they so tied into the love ethic rather than hating back, terrorizing back, being, sending the contempt back? And how long will that tradition survive? Because believe you me, when that tradition starts getting weak and it's gone, America, praying for you. You're in a world of trouble. It's true. True. Good afternoon, Brother yes, West. Yes, my sister, how are you doing today? I'm great. Um, I was moved by your uh, lament that Ida B. Wells is not a household name. I'm interested in hearing your thoughts about the importance of the intergenerational transfer of knowledge of the struggle, basic knowledge of history, to the sustaining of black prophetic fire or even to sparking new, fi new fires? Yeah, that's such a profound question. And that's very much what this book is about. And this is true not just for uh, precious black folk, but it's true for precious human beings all around the country and so many of the worlds because we live in a whole world that's driven by, by big money. And the money is very much about the erasure of memory and the erasure of historical connection so that the three dimensions of time, past, present, and future, all are confined to just the present, and the present is a repetition of instant gratification and fleeting pleasures with a corporate media generating massive weapons of distraction. You see, not the attention to the things that matter, but distraction, you see. And this is especially true for our young people. It's one reason why I spend so much time in music, because we live at a time now where Music is still the dominant transcendence of our young folk. Most are unchurched and unmosked and unsynagogued and untempled. So all they have is music to get some distance from their pain. And their music is so thin coming from the oligarchs that control recording, radio, and video, and live performance. So it's very rare now that you get a group that sounds as sweet and mellow as the Dells or the Emotions or the Delphonics or the Dramatics or Main Ingredient or the Marvelettes or the Miracles or enchantment. Why? Because those are soft voices that listen and blend with voices that then affect your soul. There is no group among young people that sing as a collectivity. There's no band other than the roots that's left on the national level. No Lakeside. No Ohio players. No Charles Wright and the Watts 103rd Street Rhythm Band. No Sly Stone. How come the young folk kids, they go to schools with no arts programs? They, they got soul murder every day in those schools. It's a vicious cycle in these schools. They don't have access to imagination and critical intelligence through the arts. Some of them don't, can't sing in tune and still make a million dollars. <laughs> Nat King Cole turns over in his grave and so does Sarah Vaughn and Carmen McRae and Aretha and Gladys. Not, no, Gladys is still alive and Aretha is still alive, not in their grave. No, I come from a people that were very concerned about getting it right when they sang the notes because souls were predicated on whether you got those notes right in that church or on the block or in the clubs. But now with the, re the corporatization of music in the same way our universities are corporatized and our schools are corporatized and so for the marketizing that's taking place dumbs down integrity, quality, decency, push to the margins, and it's all about just getting over the 11th commandment, thou shalt not get caught. <laughs> oh, that's what we teach our young folk. Get over by any means, just don't get caught. Just don't get caught. And that's a sad, sad thing. 
we reached that point. Yes, sir. Given the universal human challenge of preserving treasures in earthen vessels, what counsel do you have for aspiring prophets who seek to raise their voices in a way that will not contradict the four principles that Du Bois highlighted in your text? Uh, that's a wonderful question. What, what a wonderful group. This, this is Miami Dade College. Every time I come, y'all got this good stuff for me. Every time I come. No, I put it this way, I put actually, it this way. Actually, I'm Broward College. Oh, you what? <laughs> I got you. I appreciate that, but, but you're here now, though. You're here now, now. You're here now. I got you. I appreciate that. No, I think every generation that takes it, people who are full of, full, full of fire and full of love, full of compassion, willingness to pursue what I call the way of the cross as a Christian, but willingness to pursue the quest for unarmed truth and unconditional love, so that it's, 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 it's just a matter of example. There has to be enough examples around so that it becomes contagious. Emmanuel Kant has a wonderful line in the Critique of Pure Reason where he says, examples are the go-karts of judgment. The people's judgment is very shaped by who they're imitating, or who, what they see exemplified before them. And if young folk primarily just see marketeers everywhere they go, they go to the churches, mega churches, mega love, well, not always, mega courage, usually not, but mega churches, all. Oh. Sometimes not enough good example. They go to university. They used to be folk deeply concerned with the quest for knowledge. Now they're more entrepreneurial, trying to get their own little institutions with money flow and so forth and so on. Wu-Tang Clan got, Clan got it right, didn't they? Cream. <laughs> Cash rules. <laughs> Everything around me, but it doesn't have to rule me. It doesn't have to move. One can be old-fashioned and quest for integrity and cut against the grain, you see. And I do think young folk are hungry and they're thirsty. And Ferguson is just the peak of an iceberg. It's happening in California. It's happening in New York, Chicago. It's happening throughout the South. Young folk are fired up and they're tired of the old models of the marketeers. They won't see something what Ashwin Simpson said was real. Give me something real. That's what young folk are saying. They won't see the real thing. Well, these six are the real thing, and that's not the only ones. Could have talked about James Baldwin, or Gwendolyn Brooks, or Haki Mahibuti, or a whole host of others. We got a whole cloud of witnesses of folk who are the real thing, but I got six of them here. And this is just the, top, the, the peak of this wonderful tradition. Yes, go right ahead, my brother. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ress. Uh, oh, thank you. My name is Armando Aguilar. I wanted to ask you, in light of Obama's immigration speech on Thursday, can you comment on how well he did or not well that he did when it comes to speaking about the worth, contribution, the human dignity of these undocumented immigrants as a struggling and marginalized group? Yeah, I appreciate that question, though, very, very much. So one, thank you. we have to recognize, just like Abe Lincoln needed uh, Harriet Beecher Snow and Frederick, Frederick Douglass and FDR needed uh, A. Philip Randolph and the trade union movement, that uh, our dear brother Barack Obama, he was pressured by the magnificent wave of activism of young immigrant brothers and sisters from all around the country. I was blessed to be a small part of it in Arizona, Washington, D.C. We marched in front of the White House. Looked like we had the chance of a snowball in hell at that time. It took him a while to do it. He had political calculation, didn't want to do it before the election. Okay, he's a politician like any politician. We understand, Brother Barack. <laughs> but we want the moral conviction. I applaud what he did yesterday. I think he should have gone further. Folk need benefits. Healthcare benefits, other kinds of benefits. You can't pay taxes and no benefits. S something wrong about that. Something deeply wrong about that. But he took the first step, and of course he's going to get a firestorm from Fox News and the right wing. He's going to get that if he's singing out of tune in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> so what? That ain't new. And the sky is blue and grass is green. Of course he's going to get it. Take a stand, brother. Don't try to. Because a part of my criticism of my dear brother is that he tends to punt on second down rather than fourth down. <laughs> he gives in too quick, not enough backbone. But I was glad to see what he did and that we're gonna keep the pressure on to make sure that our immigrant brothers and sisters are, are treated in such a, uh, with decency. But I can say this, I don't like the fact that people are talking about America as a nation of immigrants. Because that overlooks our indigenous brothers and sisters, you see. That's not true. America's not a nation of immigrants. Immigrants have played a fundamental role in the shaping of America, but with some folk who are already here on their land. 
And they don't need to be in the room for us to be truthful about that. And oftentimes when people say immigrants, it downplays the distinction between voluntary immigrants and involuntary immigrants. See, when I think of the folk, my own lineage, at least on the African side, I don't know what else I got. You can see my color, so things got complicated. <laughs> we, we laugh, but it could have included rape. Could have included violation. I don't know. And I haven't hung up my dear brother Skip Gates to find out. But involuntary immigrants have a different status than voluntary immigrants. You come from Cuba, you come hitting the ground. You come from Jamaica, the great Jamaican people, they hitting the ground moving. Haiti, they hitting the ground moving. Oh, what great people they are. But my immigrants, different circumstances. Don't put it in the same category. Don't put it in the same category. There's thousands of bones on the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean that will remind us of that immigration trek of those precious, dignified Africans who came here and encountered the slave auction. And that's also what we're dealing with in Ferguson. Because we were already criminalized before we got here, and we still look at too many of our precious young black young people as if they're criminals before they've done anything. And this is true for brown, but especially for black especially for black. So I appreciate that question, and I'm gonna keep the pressure on my dear brother Barack Obama. But I applaud him this time, I applaud him. Oh yes, absolutely. All right, we have time for one more quick Ooh, just one more? question. Ooh, just one more, Lord. it has okay. to be quick. My name is Louis Armstrong, I'm also an author of the prophetic writing, and uh, I heard you say something earlier about the 400 years. Yes. And what I wanna ask you is that those 400 years that you are talking about, is they the same 400 years of Genesis uh, 15, 13, or is it some other time? Oh, in the biblical text? Yes. Oh, that's a leap you know of that. creative <laughs> imagination, my brother. Got to ask you that. No, I appreciate it. I appreciate right. it. No, no. Yeah, I, 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 it, 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 it's difficult for me to make that kind of leap in our late modern times to some of those deep truths told in the biblical text that shape my own tradition. And therefore, I would never want to make any kind of direct parallel. Because when I read the biblical text, I read it in a spirit. And of course, as a Christian, I'm Christocentric. You see, I focus on the Palestinian Jew named Jesus as the lens through which I keep track of what's in that text. And because I keep track of it in the way of keeping track of the love and justice, it doesn't really spill over into the particular years and the parallel of the years. It's more the love and justice that I'm focusing on, my brother. But you stay strong in your prophetic work. Okay, thank you, sir. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much, Cornell West. This was such a wonderful conversation. I wish it could just go on and on. you all that Professor West will be signing books outside for a while, so come on out and, um, and get your book.